Yeah, so so I, I kind of think of um, Wolf Warrior mm -hmm. tactics as as just that, a, a tactic. And it's it's a set of behaviors which have existed for a long, long time and are kind of available to all Chinese diplomats. Um, so even the even people who we think of as relatively dovish, like Tsui Tian Kai, who was until recently China's ambassador in Washington, uh, you know, we, we think of him as this kind of charming suave personality and he publicly disagreed with with jowly jins um you know antics spreading coronavirus conspiracies but but i've spoken to to people who have dealt with sway over the years and he he will go red in the face and shout at you if he if he feels like he has been put into a corner and um you know these and it's it's kind of important to stress that chinese diplomats almost never lose control so when they get angry it's a it's a calculated move and and they're capable of returning to to calm quite soon afterwards um so so those those tactics are available to everyone all the time and, and i think what happens is that the the um as the incentive structures change with with political shifts um you know individuals can decide to to turn that performative anger up to a 10 or they can keep it slightly lower um, and, and whether or not they choose to do so, as you say, some of it depends on, um, you know, the, the balance of, of fear and ambition and job security. So someone like Tsui was at the end of his career. He was, he's actually he's the same age as Foreign Minister Wang Yi and roughly the same age as Xi Jinping. He was kept on in that role um, after the standard retirement age had reached, uh, you know, what wasn't going to be promoted again and um, was in good standing politically, I think, was seen to have done a very good job in that position. And probably, you know, I, I speculate, felt empowered to take a slightly different public line than the Wolf Warriors and to, you know, follow his personal kind of preference. Um, and I think, uh, you know, whereas, whereas other diplomats, maybe people who are on the make, um, and have many years ahead of them might feel more compelled to kind of either play it safe and be nationalistic or or look for a promotion and be really wolf warrior ish because they think that that's going to be rewarded um, down the line and of course there is some evidence for that in some of the high profile um, uh, promotions that have taken place so like I said, that you know the kind of broad incentive structure changes, but individuals can can interpret um, how they want to respond to that based on how ambitious they feel, how afraid they feel, their 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 personal beliefs in terms of how China should um, conduct its diplomacy. And you know, of course, there are a lot of Chinese diplomats who who don't like this wolf warrior approach, and it's it's important to remember that. Um, while China's diplomatic corps is very different to, to many other large countries, um, there is this, this it, it's voluntary. You know, they signed up for this job and diplomats as a, as a group of people internationally tend to be drawn to that profession because they believe in the power of persuasion and talking. If they didn't, they would join the military or spy services or they, they'd serve their country in some other way. And, um, you know, I think that's true of Chinese diplomats, too. So when we see them acting in this way, uh, in, in, in some cases, at least, they're not kind of comfortable with it on a, on a personal level. And I just just add one last thing in my rather long answer to this. Um, I think one other sort of crucial factor is what does what does the Chinese leadership want from um, each relationship that it's pursuing? And um, sometimes that's going to necessitate different tactics. So um, in its relationship with Washington, the Chinese diplomats are, you know, sometimes they'll engage in wolf warrior tactics, but on the whole, especially from the ambassador, they need a stable channel of communication to the world's biggest economy and most powerful military. And so they're not gonna act out in ways that they might act in Sweden or Canada or Britain or France, um, where the stakes are a little bit lower. Uh, in, in a, you know, in Africa, there have been very few cases of wolf warrior diplomacy. And I think one reason for that is that China doesn't feel the need to um, kind of act out in that way. Its interests are different. It, they're more related to trade, gradual building of influence through economic statecraft. And so that 
that performative anger also hasn't been turned on there. So there are a whole bunch of things that that kind of um, determine how individuals will respond to those incentives.